Hello and welcome to episode 166 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I'm James Whittingham. Welcome to the program. A new study has found that climate scientists, especially those that are women, are facing increasing death threats. Still less death threats than the planet gets. Nevertheless, the climate scientists vow to persist. In a shocking move, Ford has announced that they will adopt the Tesla charging port on their upcoming cars in North America. A spokesperson from Toyota was overheard saying, what's a charging network? Do, do we need one of those? Siemens has designed an onshore wind turbine just for the US market. It fires off a gun every 30 seconds and watches baseball. The reopening of an exploded coal power plant in Australia has been delayed by six months. Here's a thought. Maybe don't rebuild a coal plant that exploded. Come on, Australia, get it together. All that and a whole lot more on this week's edition of The Clean Energy Show. Okay, so I got an update on the heat pump, which is that it's not quite installed yet. No, oh, that's a terrible update. Yeah. <laughs> What went We're wrong? getting close. What's... Progress has been made. There's more drilling that has to take place. What have they run into now? Yeah, well, the, the electrician's got to come in. So I think a lot of the basics are done, but they still have to haul the old... The old furnace is not disconnected yet. So we were hoping it would be done before we headed off on our vacation. But uh, no, and of course, it's getting hot and humid too. So it would have been nice to have the air conditioning today. Yeah. Uh, and yesterday as well. You know, last but... night it cooled off. Usually I'm okay. Last night it cooled off and was humid, and uh, we're so used to having wind here that it's natural ventilation, and we didn't have yeah. the wind the last few days, and it's been kind of a warm yeah. night. So yeah. I have the air conditioning on today for the podcast, and yeah, I use it gently because it's very warmer normal. than normal. But anyway, I looked at the um, brochure for the heat pump that I've got, and it said, I think we talked about this, it's, for some reason, they're more efficient to do air conditioning. So the brochure says the cooling efficiency is up to four times more efficient than a normal air conditioner. And I, I asked the installer guy why, and I'd heard that before. Like, you know, you buy yourself a nice heat pump like this. It cools your house, but it does it more efficiently than a normal air conditioner. And the guy installing it had a, you know, really fantastic long explanation that was so good. I didn't understand a word of it. Really oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking about. It was. But that's good that he knew. I mean, most it's guys would just knew. say, oh, I don't know. It's, it's just, that's yeah. what some pamphlet said. <laughs> but there's complicated physics involved or something. Physics, but, you say. I mean, I think the idea is that in order to heat the house, especially down to minus 20, that it just has to be built more robust. It's just, you know, they're more robust mechanisms than a normal More efficient, perhaps. So I, you know, I think just the fact that it has to do the heating and the cooling um, means that it, it works better and more efficiently as an air conditioner. Interesting. Well, there you go. That's another advantage to heat pumps that I bet a lot of people, if you didn't, if you did know that, raise your hand. No one's raising their hand in the audience. No. So, yeah, I, that's an interesting fact. They're more yeah, efficient and, for cooling. You know, of course, it was one of the reasons I never got air conditioning in this house. Is I sort of thought, well, we don't need it. We don't have that many hot days. But I also thought, well, I don't want to use a whole bunch of extra electricity. So it just feels good that we're going to cool the house, but it'll be more efficient than a normal air conditioner. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I don't know. You're still designing your cottage. I think you should put in, I'm a big proponent of whole house ventilators mm -hmm. you know I, I haven't had one i don't know anyone who's had one but it seems like a good idea like i could have used one last night they're yeah. basically just a big ventilation fan high up so yeah. they take the hot wear hot air out and bring in the cool air and where we live at a fairly high elevation i mean compared to say sea level it's like almost two thousand feet uh, we generally have cool nights and dry prairie you know arid air so it might work for a lot of people in a lot of situations. Not for others, but, you know, it's. Yeah. Uh, I like fresh air, too. And that's kind of the system I had here at my house. It, like, it wasn't a proper exhaust fan, but, you know, that's what I had. As soon as it cools down at night, turn on my exhaust fans, and, uh, yeah, it would normally cool the house very well. So you have a whole, you have a house uh, heat exchanger, right? You have the... Uh, a yeah, heat recovery ventilation. ventilator. But it's yeah. recovering what you don't want recovered in this situation. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, yeah, like, w certainly we do turn it on at night to exhaust the hot air, but because it's a, 
I don't know. It, it, it doesn't, no, it doesn't work that well to exhaust the hot air because it's sucking in air at a similar temperature. Yeah. It's transferring the, the, I wonder if you could turn that off. That would be a neat trick, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be, yeah, that, that'd be a good feature. Uh, so yeah, I'm off to, uh, the United Kingdom this week on Thursday. We're heading off on a trip on a vacation and, uh, Brian, did you know do... we're bigger in the United Kingdom than we are in Canada, the country that <laughs> we was... podcast from? I was noticing that, yes, in the science and nature category of Apple Podcasts, we're doing quite well in Great Britain. So hello to all of our listeners in Great Britain. Yes, and I assume um, the king is listening. If you if you see me wandering around the streets with my clean energy show cap on, uh, and say hello. And t-shirt I see now. You've got a t-shirt too. Oh, yes, and the t-shirt. Um, these are the clean energy show t-shirts. Very nice. Uh, looks fantastic. I'm going to bring that with me as well. Um, they're great. Love them. Okay. Okay. So where are you going to be in the UK? Yeah. So we're flying into London, and but we're going to go up to Wales. So that's where I'm hoping to podcast from is Port Marion, Wales. It's a seaside town there. And uh, we're going to go then across on a ferry to Dublin for a few days and then uh, back to London. So yeah, you know, hopefully should be, the show should be coming out at roughly the regular time next week, assuming everything works. I'm 99% sure I can podcast from Wales. And then uh, after that, I guess we're going to take a week off. Our first satellite uh, production, international production of the Clean Energy Show. As far as I know, I don't remember yeah. any of them. We've had 165 <laughs> of them. My God. Uh, yeah. That's cool. I look forward to that and the exciting, uh, um, you know, unpredictability of it. <laughs> I thrive on it. I love that stuff. Um, good luck with your trip. And if you do see Brian, say hi. And if you see... Yeah. It, <laughs> It'll be, I mean, you've rented the listers on airports before, so who knows? <laughs> it's, who knows? It's possible. So what can you say about the Clean Energy Show t-shirt? We've talked about the hats before, which, by the way, we're hoping to get back online in a week or two. Yeah, they're excellent, high-quality shirts. It's a, They're 100% cotton. Um, there's a couple of different colors available. This is like the navy blue. There's also like a light blue and something, I forget what else, but um, highly recommended. Oh, uh, yeah, it looks okay. I, I'm looking at you on a Skype, and it looks pretty good from where you are, so that's good. Uh, I am I should order some, too, you know. I uh, They seem to work out well. Uh, if you have a Clean Energy Show t-shirt, tell us what you think of it. I wonder if the logo's too big, but it doesn't seem to be. Brian I, yeah, says I it's think so. okay. I think it's fine, yeah. Uh, so a programming note, I guess, is we'll be back next week with a normal show, except Brian will be far away. And speaking with a slight British accent, which you'll probably pick up, or a Wales accent. <laughs> yeah. And then the week after that, we'll have a repeat episode. I'll probably throw up a repeat episode uh, onto the feed just to keep you occupied. Because I know okay. a lot of people don't listen to our shows over uh, the holiday season in North America. Maybe that'll throw up our year-end show or something like that again and have a chance to listen to it. Um, yeah, So, but then we'll be back in two weeks with another new show. Brian, we had a unexpected storm here where we live in Canada and it was not it was the first storm warning we've had without a watch there was no weather watch yeah the storm just came up yep. and did nasty things well not too nasty but I mean it flooded streets and that was kind of the, the issue and also the fact that there was a tornado <laughs> yeah <laughs> which tornado actually touched down. hit just outside our city and we had tornado warnings on our cell phones and and i looked at it i thought i was disregarding because we'd had so many tornado warnings last year and yeah. they were far away because of the way the cell tower was work that, yeah no this one was pretty close to my house just yes. a few kilometers and away, it said yeah. south going north northeast so yeah uh i actually told the kids to lock up the lock everything up and uh congregate because uh this was a serious matter and there was some swearing involved too so <laughs> it was a bit uh a bit weird and uh, i told my son to go upstairs because we have a two-story house overlooking a field <laughs> to look for the thing <laughs> see if he <laughs> saw anything <laughs> so he was on lookout because <laughs> we knew where it was anyway uh yeah the storm came without warning well it came with a warning at the last second but without watch i guess well so, apparently one of the radars the weather radars yes, the radar is always out it drives yeah. my uh, weather geek family crazy that that's always out i don't know if lightning hits it or gophers eat the wires but you know something happens and our streets were flooded yeah 
And I was out at a movie um, at our nearby mall. And so we came out of the movie and it was pouring rain. We had to run to the car. We drove home. It was probably the worst visibility I've ever had in a rainstorm. Like with the wipers going full speed, it was very difficult to see anything in front of me. The water was coming down so fast. That would have been the perfect situation for the, you drive a Tesla Model 3. It would have been the perfect situation for the summon feature to summon it right up to the door of the movie We there. thought about using it actually, but it was the car was parked around the corner of the building so we couldn't see it from where we were. But if we could have seen it from where we were, I would have used it. But question, would the car have seen well enough in a torrential downpour? Yeah, actually that's true. It, it does degrade the visibility. See, that's yeah, disappointing. It, that's the time yeah. when you need it most. That's the time you need it. I always <laughs> fantasize about doing that. coming out, And that's what I tell people is that you know, the reason you would use it is when you come yeah. out of movie theater or come pick you up with yeah. a torrential rainstorm. Uh, well, maybe it's just a rainstorm would, would work. But anyway, so, so the, uh, we got a lot of um, floods on the north part of the city where I live. And the, we drove around and the streets were, our street was flooded. We live at a high point on our street, thankfully. But the end of our street was a low point and it always floods, I guess. So I'm told I've been here for 13, 14 years and I'm still learning things. But anyway, um, we drove around and, and went through some water in the electric car. And then we saw the main street that connects our little subdivision was flooded. And there's not a lot of ways in and out. <laughs> but mm -hmm. next storm, when we're running away from a tornado, we know which way not to go because that flooded. And there was five cars stuck. Five idiot yeah. people stuck yeah. in the water. But if I could say in their defense, like I said, like the visibility was so poor when I was driving through it, I could have easily driven into a lake and I wouldn't have known. Well, you know, somebody yelled and help. And my kids got out of the car and ran into the water. Oh, wow. And they weren't, they were just yelling help. People were all pissed off and frantic. So it wasn't really a frantic call, but yeah. they were frantic because they were, you know, panicking that they'd wreck their cars. And yeah, uh, yeah, so they were calling for other people to help them push out. So my kids were actually went through into the cold water. And then I found out that uh, manhole covers were being blown off. So you oh, don't want to walk, you don't want to drive in water where you can't see the bottom and you don't want to walk in water where the manhole yes. cover might be blown off. And yes. there was, they, they, my son, the city worker said, well, I went on the sidewalk. But when you <laughs> go to push the car, you go onto the road and there was manhole yeah. covers near the sidewalk on that oh, particular street. I don't know if there normally is, but on that street there is. So um, that would be a bad way to go, you know? So yeah, anyway, just... Kind of unusual, and I'm still haven't cutting it to my pool because it hasn't been sunny. So maybe tomorrow night. Maybe tomorrow night. Brian, the um, Ford has made an announcement that is one of the big pivotal points in the adoption of electric vehicles. There's a few markers along the way. I would count them as this is one of the major ones. We haven't had one for a while. Uh, you know, Tesla releasing the Model 3. Uh, Volkswagen deciding to go all EV, um, you know, and the Inflation Reduction Act makes a big difference. Uh, there's lots of other things before that, because we've been watching this for 20 years, you and I. But this is a big deal. Do you want to explain what the deal is with this, what Ford announced with Elon Musk on a Twitter spaces that caught everyone by surprise? Yeah, so Ford has announced that they're going to adopt the Tesla charging connection for their vehicles in North America. So um, there's now two major standards left in terms of charging connectors for cars. So Europe decided to standardize on the CCS connector. So they passed that as a law several years ago. I think there were initially some Tesla cars that were sold in Europe with the North American Tesla connector, but quickly the EU got their act together and said, no, 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 we need a universal standard. So it's CCS in Europe, which is a bigger, larger, fatter connector. In North America, um, there has been no official standard set. So at this point, Tesla is kind of the default leader just because they have the most electric cars out there and they have the most electric car charging stations. 
And it's, of course, one of the biggest problems if you're trying to sell electric vehicles like Ford is trying to do. Ford is legitimately trying to sell electric vehicles, but they don't have a charging network like Tesla does. So it's a major strike against them if you're looking at electric cars. So they have decided to adopt the Tesla connector. They're going to start with access for Ford cars in 2024 by use of an adapter. And I don't know if that will be supplied by Tesla or supplied by Ford. It's going to be no. manufactured by Tesla, that much I know. And I think Ford then, you know, notifies people to go to the dealership to pick it up or perhaps even mails it to them. I don't know. Probably not. Yeah. But then in 2025, the Ford cars will have the Tesla charging port in them. And uh, this is a huge deal. So it, it feels like a North American standard is maybe starting to come together here. We speculated about this a while ago because Tesla, sometime in the last year, they made their connecting charger standard public. And, and instead of calling it the Tesla connector, it's the NACS, the North American charging standard. And they made it open so anybody could adopt it if they wanted to. We speculated at the time that, yeah, it's probably too late. You know, people have been... Going down the road of CCS, there's lots of CCS chargers, not as many as Tesla chargers, but, you know, lots of cars have been made. So at the time we speculated, yeah, probably nobody else is going to jump on this. But Ford is the number two seller of electric vehicles in North America after Tesla, and they have decided to adopt this connector. So uh, I think it'd be great if this did become the North American standard, because it would certainly be better if there was only one connector instead of two. And of course, the Tesla connector, I think, is the better one. It's just much smaller. It's neater. Um, the CCS connector, it's, it's very large, and it's large because it has uh, kind of DC on the bottom and then AC on the top, because you need both for your car. So if you're charging it at home, you use AC power. You're charging in a fast charger. It's, it's always DC power. So the CCS connector, it's, it's in two different sections. Um, and that's why the connector is so big. But, you know, many years ago, like 10 years ago, Tesla figured out, no, no, you can just do it with two pins. And somehow it handles AC and DC with the same small connector with two big pins. And uh, I don't know. I think this is great. Do, do you think the other car makers are going to chime in on this and, and adopt it? I'm, of course, hopeful they will. Uh, you know, somebody said on Twitter to us uh, that... It doesn't matter. The connector doesn't matter. Just the, the charging network is what matters. Having said that, when we did do our one test supercharging with our new Chevrolet Bolt, my wife couldn't get that big connector in. I mean, <laughs> uh, on the CCS. Yeah, she couldn't get the big CCS. It's big and yeah. it's unwieldy. <laughs> it's, it is, it's not a, a gas station uh, gas pump. It's a big, heavy, awkward thing that you have to point in the right direction and push it in. And it seems such a terrible design compared to Tesla, which is a fraction of the size, which yeah. is, you know, even more elegant than my, my level two home connector. Um, mm -hmm. what do you call it? The J 77. I forget what it is, but there's a yeah. number there. J, uh, yeah. And you know, kind of the standard, um, home charging connector. So yeah, I would love to see it. I would love to, I mean, if Chevy goes, it's over, you know, cause mm -hmm. they're the number three EV maker and, you know, when General Motors, if they adopted it, and I hope they do, it's mm -hmm. it's such a, you know, Tesla has been offering this possibility for years. They've publicly said, you know, if anybody wants to jump on board, maybe the terms weren't right. Maybe maybe it was too hard for their brand to take. But this is a, yeah. is a great thing. And, you know, Tesla may not be standing one day. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll go broke on robots, but their charging network will be ubiquitous, hopefully. And that'll be a, a major important thing. And they work. They work, Brian. They work all yeah. the time. That's but the of course, thing. like just wind back five years, everybody still thought Tesla was going bankrupt. So why would you adopt the Tesla charging standard if they're just going to go bankrupt? But I think the other important aspect of this is they're not just using the connector. They're, they're talking to Tesla and they're cooperating with Tesla to get access to everything because it isn't just the connector. And like I said, it's now an open standard. Anybody you know, you could pick up the plans for the open standard and, you know, put a Tesla connector on your electric bike if you wanted to. Everybody can do that. But it's not just that. It's the software that's that's part of it. So Ford is going to work with Tesla so that the charging, the whole charging experience is very similar because the great thing about the Tesla, it's not just, you know, the connector and everything, but you put a destination into the navigation 
it does all the routing and including the supercharger stops and how long you have to wait there for. You know, this is not a thing with cars other than Tesla. So if Ford has access to the whole system, then it should be just as seamless. And it's, the, you know, the Ford cars are not going to use the Tesla app. This is what's being used currently. Like there's a few magic dock connectors. So you can go to some Tesla uh, charging stations and they have a CCS adapter built into the charger. You use the Tesla app on your phone and then you can charge with CCS at a few select stations. But that's not the whole experience. That's the Tesla app. But Ford is going to integrate that into the Ford app, the Ford car, the Ford operating system. So it should be fairly seamless for the Ford users. Yeah. And you'll, I, it's, it's unclear whether they'll pay a premium, but hopefully it won't be much. Musk only said that it would be affordable. Yeah. And reasonably priced. So the experience, hopefully for Ford owners, it's not just the fact that those charges are available, but they're plug and charge, right? The Tesla yeah. experience is plug in. It yeah. knows who you are because of your yeah. car talking to the machine, and then it'll bill your account. That yeah. is so much because people have trouble just making the payment. Some a lot of the reasons these chargers don't work is the yeah. payment part of it. Yeah. Like it's not accepting the credit card, it's not accepting the app or the, uh, you know, the um, the chip on your phone or whatever. So yeah, there's just a great opportunity here. And you know who could take advantage of that? Toyota. Toyota mm -hmm. could uh, get right back into this thing if they said, okay, all of our cars yeah. are going to have Tesla chargers and giddy up because that'll it's a huge advantage. I mean, yeah. I if if Teslas were a bit cheaper, I would have bought one just for the supercharging network. Mm -hmm. You know, because that is so important. Um, it, it's, it, if you're going to leave the city, if you're going to leave where you live, it's mm -hmm. way better to have a Tesla because those networks are there. Now, having said that, what's going to happen to Tesla owners, if, um, if they're going to have to really keep building the supercharger network fast, uh, increase the pace of that. Yeah. Well, they, they put out a tweet the other day that says that they're opening a new Tesla charging station somewhere in the world every 13 hours. So they are going fast. They're going hard. Um, yeah, it may not be fast enough in some cases, but they've got such a huge lead in North America, like the number of Ford electric cars compared to the number of Tesla electric cars is still very, very small. So I, you know, I don't anticipate any problems. It's just those long weekends, you know, those long weekends where it's already busy. Yeah. And yeah. if you have to wait for a, a Mustang Mach-E instead of a Tesla, you might be a little irked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they also have a good sort of idea of where what's what stations are busy and where the demand is. You know, yeah. um you were saying that you when you went to Calgary that it was worse situation than here in our small city just because we were late to get them. We got the version 3s and they have the version 2s yeah. there. Yeah. And it's hard to believe that a city of what is it a million and a half people or something yeah. now like they only had eight version 2 chargers. But yeah, this is where you like you and mentioned Toyota. It's a big Toyota. tourist center too. It's by the Rocky <laughs> Mountains and Banff National yeah. Park and everything. But you mentioned Toyota. This could actually be end up to be a huge benefit for Toyota because they're so late to the game. It like they might as well use the Tesla standard because you know they've invested nothing in the And they CCS have worked with Tesla point. before. Uh, yeah, twenty years ago they came up with a Rav Four that was made by <laughs> Tesla. The the elect yeah. electric motor was so. Yeah, yeah, they should really get on that and and that would be it i'd love to see it uh i don't know what this means for all the people who are investing in third-party chargers there's all kinds of i mean there's expos for charging you know like there's yeah a lot of companies making a lot of charges but they're finicky and they're they take a long time to prove and uh the tesla's got it down they've got it down they've got manufacturing where they manufacture the whole thing even the cement yeah. platform and that goes out on a truck and it's ready to install very quickly yeah, and um, yeah, I lost my thought what I was going to say, but the, the um, oh yeah, the, the, yes, there's a lot of CCS chargers out there that would probably go to waste if we ended up switching over to the Tesla connector in North America. But yeah, since they don't work that well anyway, it's like, ugh, maybe let's cut our losses and just switch right now. That'd be, that'd be great for me. I mean, I it's, it's nice to have options, but my goodness, uh, the Chatamo is on the Nissan Leafs and I think one other vehicle. And they're, yeah, they're and still at the Chargers. They, they're still yeah. there. They'll still have a connector there. 
Yeah, and of course there's adapters too. So adapters, like in the future, we can put Tesla adapters on the CCS chargers and still make some use of them, I guess. That's true too, yeah. But you know, it's not, somebody was pointing out, it's not that hard to change the connector on a charger. That's a small part of the puzzle. Like you've yeah. got giant cabinets connected to the grid, which turn the power on and off and regulate yeah. the power. Then you've got the charger stalls themselves. The, the cable and the connector, um, not so much a big part of it. So it, it would be yeah. easy. I mean, they have to be replaced anyway, right? Because of just use and wear and tear that uh, maybe that's not the end of the world. So we'll see. But they are pretty big. Have you ever used one? I guess you probably haven't. Have no, used... I haven't. No, they're, they're nasty business. You should... Well, you've never used one to charge your Tesla with an adapter? No, I don't have the adapter, so. Really? How much is the adapter? It's just a couple hundred bucks, but my Tesla is a bit older, so it actually needs some kind of an update before it can use the adapter. Like a hardware update that you have to go to the shop yeah, and pay yeah, for? Yeah, yeah. And the, it says in my... If I try to buy the adapter, it says, oh, sorry, your car's not compatible, but we're planning to do upgrades in the future. Well, I still think that Tesla's going to continue to get that sweet, sweet IRA money to, uh, you know, have uh, those magic docs come out in the future. Yeah. So that's going to keep happening. Anyway, it's a huge story. It is... Uh, We'll we'll see, you know, what comes next because, uh, you know, Chevrolet or uh, GM in general have a lot of new EVs coming. They've got the Silverado pickup truck. There's a good opportunity there. Uh, it's not made yet, and it's not that big of a mm -hmm. deal, I don't think, to change the uh, – maybe it is, but, you know, it's – these are opportunities here, and people should and be. It, yeah. It's a real sign that Ford is serious. They really want to sell EVs. And I, I think the other legacy automakers, they maybe haven't come around to the fact that they actually have to make EVs and they, they still feel they, they don't necessarily really want to. But Ford, the number two position, they really want to sell EVs. And this deal is definitely, you know, shows that that's true. You know, I wish Rivian did. I wish Rivian did that too. Yeah. You know, they're starting but, from the scratch like Tesla did. But they also didn't, whenever um, RJ, whatever his name is, uh, the CEO. Scarringe. Scarringe never liked to talk about Tesla. He never wanted to be compared in interviews to Tesla. Uh, so he kind of always politely avoided that. But, you know, if you did that, it would have been a huge advantage for Rivian. People would have flocked to Rivian mm -hmm. a lot quicker. And they're, they're only just starting to build out their supercharger, their adventure network, as it were, close to national parks and things like that. But they're not in the parks. They're actually, you know, yeah. many miles away from the parks in a lot of cases, not in the parks. So if you did, if you just went with Tesla, you could just have the Tesla network as it is and as it expands and put your own branded chargers with the Tesla adapter in those adventure locations, whether they be you know, parks or just places where people go for adventure. I don't know where that is because <laughs> James yeah. doesn't get a lot of adventure, unfortunately. <laughs> anyway, let's get on with the show. A new study has found that climate scientists, especially those that are women, are facing increasing death threats and attacks online. This is from Vice News. Almost three quarters of climate scientists who appear in the media every month. These are people who are regularly uh, going on um, TV and uh, in the quoted in newspapers and so forth, they have experienced online abuse. And women are bearing the brunt of it, a new global witness report has found. Climate scientists have had their credibility and work attacked, and they received death threats, witnessed even their family members being exposed to the vitriol. And we found uh, online abuse, um, they say, is common, and for many it takes a mental health and a f physical toll on them. Uh, it inhibits the climate discourse, which is a problem and which is what they want to do. So online hate could inspire climate scientists to stay out of the public eye at a time when climate action is more urgent than ever. And for women, the attacks are also quite targeted. Isn't that true for so many things these days? And it's just, Brian, I don't know about the world. I, I, I sit here as an old man, middle-aged man, <laughs> feeling like an old man. And I'm not, I don't know about the world. I mean, a lot of people don't. I mean, a lot of people, younger people don't. And sometimes they vote for Trump when they feel that way. And sometimes they, you know, become reactionary uh, haters on uh, Twitter. Well, 
first of all, you're older than middle age. Where's middle age? <laughs> I don't know, but you're past it. Oh, you're damn past it. it. <laughs> I'm, I'm hurtling toward... I. I can't eat off the seniors menu at Denny's now, so officially. So, and I no, do. And I, I, I will say I don't think we've ever received any death threats. We do occasionally <laughs> get nasty comments from people. I guess especially on the the TikTok video, a lot of you know, a lot of nasty comments on there. But we don't engage in that. So. You read the comments? Have you read? No, the no, you did. You oh, told me. Oh, well, I don't read them anymore. I, <laughs> I'm too old for that. I, I've got a life I have to live. Precious days left of it. I'm not going to read vitriol on, on Twitter. But people argue, you know, the the more is some of the things on TikTok that take off are when people get into arguments in the comment yeah. section and that makes it suddenly there's a million views because it's a hot topic. Yes, even it's though a it might wedge be issue. Something about, you know, California banning gas lawnmowers or something like that. It's uh wokeism at its worst. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, California a, has a big influence on the rest of the world. It's amazing. So more than a third of a fact women said their sex or gender have been brought up, and only 3% of men have had that brought up. A fifth of affected women have received threats of physical violence, and 13% of affected women have received threats of sexual violence. Classy. Uh, yeah, so my point is, race, of course, plays a factor as well, but my point is, you know, Hug a client, climate scientist today, respect what they do, like their tweets, uh, give them positive, uh, you know, um, algorithmic uh, feedback, and uh, yeah, and let's be thankful that they exist because they are continuing. They're not stepping. Yeah. They're not. It's too important. It's, it's literally life and death of the planet. Which reminds me of the song that we played on the podcast a couple of years ago from our friends in Australia whose name I'm blanking on right now. Me too. Sorry. Damn She's it. probably not listening. She's far too busy. She's probably not listening. Uh, but that was a, that, that song was a sort of a tribute to scientists. Um, the people with the um, honest government ads that account, yeah. they uh, are mostly concentrated in Australia, but sometimes they, you know, have uh, a worldwide um, appeal as well for depending on what they talk about. So. Speaking of Australia. <laughs> Speaking of Australia, let's move on to more Australian news. No more ignoring our Australian listeners. So this is a story about a coal plant in Australia. And uh, the story is from Renew Economy. The return to service of the Calide Sea coal-fired power station in Queensland, which exploded... In dramatic circumstances, two years ago has been delayed by another six months. How do coal months. plants explode? I know how coal mines <laughs> explode, but how do coal plants explode? Uh, the, the, the turbine. Water pressure? Too high? The turbine uh, exploded for some reason. Okay. But it's been delayed by another six months because one of the cooling towers collapsed. Really? Yeah. So um, this is just a terrible idea. It's going to cost around... Four hundred million dollars to bring this uh, exploding coal plant back online. <laughs> um, so this was back in May 2021. The turbine suddenly exploded, an event blamed on the failure of the generator protection systems. So maybe it was spinning too fast or something. Um, the accident-prone facility suffered further woes last October when the cooling tower of Unit C3 partially collapsed leading to an investigation that concluded both the C3 and C4 towers needed to be demolished and rebuilt. So uh, it's now won't be operational till July. Um, you know, this is, uh, this means that the repaired coal unit will be back online after the new Chinchilla battery, a 100 megawatt, 200 megawatt hour facility that began construction last year, but it's going to be finished before these ridiculous repairs of the ridiculous coal power station. Brian, I think Four. people who don't listen to our show don't get it. They don't get it. It's pretty simple. Solar, Four wind, batteries, hundred, fast, simple, cheap. $400 million to repair this coal station. That's going to be shut down because all coal plants are going to be shut down. It is the law of the world. You have like to be at taken least offline. if it was a natural gas plant, you could maybe make an argument for spending the money. But for coal, I mean, this is ridiculous. They're, They're basically the window. illegal any day now. Yeah. And I've got a story about that later in the show, too. 
Uh, moving right along, since our show is not, Siemens has designed an onshore wind turbine just for the United States market. This is from Electric. Uh, specifically designed for U.S. weather conditions, which apparently is different than European weather conditions and other people's weather conditions. Harnessing the wind conditions most common in the United States and features a design lifetime longer than the industry standard. Uh, quote, with a country the size of the United States, we take into account the unique challenges of onshore wind sites from coast to coast, including, this is interesting, it's a vast country, transportation costs. So that's got to play into it. Logistics as well when you're transporting to the site from the manufactured place. I understand that. Uh, varied wind conditions and environments, electrical and power delivery requirements, which are different than the rest of the world, and the uh, IRA incentives, which means you have to manufacture parts of it or all of it in the United States. So good for them. Yeah, well, we've often talked about wind turbines are often built where they're needed, right? Because they're so ridiculously large. Um, so I suspect that these ones are not the, the biggest ones, but they're taking the transportation into account because they're going to have to de deploy these all over the U.S. Right. Colorado has upped its game in the EV support yeah, so EV tax credits in Colorado. I thought I would just mention this in case we have any listeners in Colorado interested in buying an electric car. They've really upped their EV tax credits. So if your EV has an MR MSRP up to $80,000, you can get a tax credit of $5,000. If it's um, under $35,000, then you can get $2,500 uh, of a tax credit. So when you add this to the federal tax credit... This is a massive, massive savings. Um, so there's an example here. This is from Electrek that uh, a Tesla Model Y long range dual motor all wheel drive is uh, $50,000, basically $50,490. So if you add the federal and the Colorado tax credit, that gets the price down to $37,990 for a long range uh, Tesla Model Y in Colorado. So that's uh, yeah, of course, some, something like the Chevy dollar. Bolt would be basically free. It'd be <laughs> yeah, basically. sixteen five or seventeen thousand dollars or something like that. I mean, the yeah. lease payments on that would be um, affordable for a lot of people. Yeah, uh, especially if you get a good lease arrangement, and even you know, like a Nissan Leaf. We were talking uh, many many shows ago about the idea that you know a high school student could get a lease for a Leaf in some places for a hundred dollars a month, which would be what they'd maybe spend on gas. Yep on a crappy old galoppy yep. that they'd have to fix and you could have a you know cruise around in a brand new car <laughs> yeah do some ubering on the side to do pay some for ubering it. on the side exactly it's time for the tweet of the week this is from mark jacobson climate researcher and this is getting back to uh bad ideas georgia's in the USA, Georgia, the state, its Volktol nuclear reactor will never pay off the CO2 and pollution emissions it has already caused to be emitted into the atmosphere. Since not only uh, it allowed 15 to 18 years of such emissions being put back into the atmosphere by delaying things, it prevented construction of six to seven times the energy output equivalent of uh, wind, water, and solar. So... You could have got six to seven times the output of other things for the same price, and you, they delayed that because it took 18 years. You could have put that money into it over the 15 to 18 years. So it's $35 billion for 2.23 gigawatts, and the nuclear is 15.7 million per megawatt. That's not megawatt hours. That's just per output. Uh, viz, 1 million per megawatt for new wind and solar. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, if it were equal, you would say, hey, mm -hmm. let's do the other because it's faster. If for yeah. no other reason, nuclear safety aside. Uh, so six to seven times the cost per kilowatt hour uh, is wind and solar. So that's just, yeah. And also it's 18 to 19 years from plan to operation that was. Didn't intend to be that way, but that's what it worked out to be. But it's always one to three years for wind and solar. So the grid could have benefited from having all that CO2 removed many, many years ago. Yeah, I think we've said this before. If there's existing nuclear, keep it running. But if you're building new nuclear, all you're really 
doing is delaying the deployment of, you know, solar, wind, batteries, things that are cheaper, quicker, work better. Um, you know, even on the shorter time frame, we discussed this at one point, you know, six to eight years is more the norm for how long it takes to build a nuclear power plant. But that's six to eight years of carbon, you know, carbon emissions from whatever you're replacing. If, if you're, rep you know, coal, natural gas, whatever, uh, this is ridiculous. We, we can't stop delaying this anymore. And there's downtime for repairs that cut the whole thing off. You can segment, uh, segmentize, you know, wind and, and solar farms. And if you have to do repairs on the whole thing, doesn't have to go online. So that's just one advantage. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we've got a story here from Bloomberg about ads that have been banned in the UK. Hello to the UK. I will be there next week or later this the week. The Clean Energy Show UK Tour. Tour, UK tour, tour, tour. Ooh, we're going to have to do tour t-shirts. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I think we've reported on this before in the past, is that the Advertising Standards Authority, every once in a while, will uh, force advertisers to take down basically ads that are greenwashing. So uh, there's a whole new round. Uh, this article has six different ads that have been banned for greenwashing. So I've got a couple of examples here, which I uh, highlighted and then the highlighting disappeared. Uh, okay, so one is from Lufthansa. So they've got an ad campaign called Make Change Fly. Lufthansa last year debuted an ad that featured the slogan, Connecting the World, Protecting Its Future. And it, the um, Advertising Standards Authority ruled in March that the ad could not run in the UK because there are currently no environmental initiatives or commercially viable technologies in the aviation industry that would substantiate that absolute green claim. Greenwashing is bad enough at the best of times, but having absolutely yeah. nothing? Yes. Yeah, so uh, not, you're not even offering anything. They are not protecting the future. What um, are they recycling? They their, their, their pudding? That they give you on the plane, uh, the, yeah, using plastic forks, no more. I mean, what's going on? That's that's such bogus nonsense. Yeah. So um, banks are another one. So HSBC has been slapped as well. Um, the the um, like many big banks, HSBC has been the target of widespread criticism for its funding of oil and gas projects. A poster advert that ran in 2021 sought to address these concerns by publicizing a goal to provide up to $1 trillion in financing and investment globally to help our clients transition to net zero. This is the message on their advertising. But um, at Free Cities, a group of uh, UK groups complained and uh, they argued that the HSBC continues to fund polluting industries and uh, the Advertising Standards Authority agreed that most consumers would not know that. So sure, maybe they are funding clean projects, but they're also funding dirty projects. So they've got to put that on the poster. I hate greenwashing. I watch TV. I see the oil industry doing it. There's usually a ukulele to make you feel happy about what they're talking about. And I want to throw things at my TV screen because I know I'm being lied to, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know that there's any people with actual green credentials that have advertised, you know, like I'd, I'd like to see something that what is the best example that they've actually done something useful that are not just BS because it's mm -hmm. all crap and it drives me crazy. Um, oh, is it that time? It's time for, uh, what is it time for Brian? It's time for the lightning round. Time for the lightning round. The lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate, clean energy, and transportation. Taiwan legislatures require all new, newly built, expanded, or altered structures that meet specific conditions to have rooftop solar panels incorporated into the building's design and installed on them. A few Taiwan. Hopefully, China doesn't come and take them away. Oh, that's maybe too soon. I didn't want to get political, but there. Yeah. So I, oh, screw you, China. I know you're listening. I know that white van in front of my house has a, somebody in it from the Chinese government uh, spying on me. Power prices dip to negative in Europe uh, for uh, why? Okay, low demand combined with sunny conditions and malt water. And they, that's lifted hydropower to really high levels. 
and solar power production. So yeah, they what they do when they have too much energy, they pay people to use it. Sometimes. Yeah, and we've you know talked about overnight rates in some places that are super low to charge your car. Well, in uh, when the power prices go negative, they pay you to charge your car, which is amazing. Usually it's industry that can use yeah. a large chunk of stuff, but this is going to happen a lot more often. Uh, we need to get lots more storage in place to not need this, but uh, you know your factory might do an extra shift because there's free power because of a sunny forecast one of these days as we transition to a full green grid. Uh, United States oil and gas giant Chevron has acknowledged its flagship carbon capture and storage project off Australia's northwest coast. Australia again. Hello, Australia. Is operating at just a third of its capacity. This is uh, problems always seem to bedevil the carbon capture world, Brian. And of course, that leads us to be skeptical of the whole thing. It is the largest carbon capture facility in the world. Britain's opposition party. Hello again, Britain. Stay tuned for the Clean Energy Show tour. You know, we have to write wherever you go on the back of the T-shirts. It's going to be an extra expense. But, you know, Wales, where else are you going? Anywhere outside of London other than Wales? Okay. Well. Uh, <laughs> Dublin. We're going to Dublin. I had my mind. Well, that's only three things then. Well, go somewhere else. We need a list. We need a, you know, it's got to be a list or it looks dumb. Okay. No, there's been small tours that have T-shirts that with them. And just, uh, sure. Sure. Yeah, we can do that. The uh, Clean Energy Show Britain tour, uh, UK extravaganza. Britain's opposition party and likely the next government, according to polls, confirmed it will block all new domestic oil and gas if it wins power. Yay for them. Invest heavily in renewables instead, they say. So to invest in the green jobs of the future and to bring bills down, which is a good selling point if you're a politician. Uh, oh, it's time for a CS Fast Fast. California's $3.6 trillion economy is bigger than India's economy. Did you know that? That's incredible. Wow, that's amazing. Considering, I mean, what's India? What, just to hit a billion people or something like that? Oh, it's over a billion, yep. And yeah, well, that that's, economy is also growing too to catch up to what... Um, first world uh, economies are. From Electric, the U.S. built offshore wind substation is sailing to New York. So in offshore substations, they collect and stabilize power that the wind turbines generate. Uh, this is, you know, the, these big boxes you see around power things. You don't know what they do, but they're there. And they need to be there. Uh, they're floating the thing from Texas all the way up to the north uh, coast of the United States, northeast coast. It's 60 feet tall. And was designed in engineers in Kansas near Corpus Christi. It was built and this by an offshore services company, which is the largest fabricator of offshore stuff in the United States. Headline in the Ottawa Citizen, Brian, look out for this. Killer whales appear to be teaching each other how to sink boats. <laughs> this is not the onion. <laughs> this is a real newspaper. Uh, so if people, in fact, that nature is indeed turning on us i want you to have heard it here first so that's why i included that uh since the ira became law companies have announced at least 31 new battery manufacturing projects in the united states that was nine months ago when we wow. had that shocking news of the ira and that's more than has been announced in the last four years combined so buckle up my friend cleaning up alberta's oil patch would cost 260 billion dollars Internal documents warn, and guess who's going to pay for that? Albertans. Although they'll probably get the feds, blame the feds for it for some reason. For the New York Times, Ukraine plans Eastern Europe's largest wind farm. You see, Ukraine going all in, as we said last week, on renewables because it's tough to blow up a wind farm. So, yeah, nuclear plants. A little scary. Uh, China needs $38 trillion in money to hit their climate goals early, but they're hitting their climate goals early. Their 2030 goals should be done early. Solar power investment to exceed oil for the first time, says the International Energy Agency chief. That's $1.7 trillion. This is not renewables altogether. This is just yeah, solar. Just solar. More money is going into just solar than all of the oil industry combined and finally this week it's a ces fast fact the average cost overrun for new power plants 
are broken down as follows. Nuclear, 120% overrun, which is modest compared to some of the overruns we've talked about on the show. Hydro dams are 75% over. Uh, fossil fuel uh, generating stations are often 16%. Wind is 13%, which is kind of close and a little bit surprising, but solar is only 1%. So if you have a 1% average overrunning cost, where's the money going to flow? Who are the banks going to support? Where's investment going to just get sucked into? Everyone, that is our show for this week. We thank you for listening as always next week. Wales, hopefully, in the United hopefully. Kingdom. If Brian's plane flies safely and everything and he doesn't get food poisoning or what else can happen to you? Who knows? We'll Wales see. could attack you in Wales and try and tip your boat over or your plane. And uh, then we'll have a repeat episode after that week. So please take the time to contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. If you look at your show notes, the notes in your app, if you expand them, it's all there. Where to find us on Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, it's all there. Uh, you can even leave us a online voicemail message, which is our favorite thing. And don't forget to check out the YouTube channel because we have special features and a video version of the show. Uh, check out the Clean Energy Store for an exciting t-shirt like the one Brian's wearing. Modeling, I would say. It looks good quality from here, honestly. It's great. I'm surprised. I have to, <laughs> have to order some for my family. Uh, if you're new to the show, please subscribe on your podcast app so you can see us every week and have those episodes delivered, uh, you know, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, whenever we come out. Um, it varies, mostly in the middle of the week. We'll see you next time. See you next week. From Wales. The Clean Energy Show.